Um, hey, everybody. Um, welcome to the panel on federal legislation at the EDN conference, which is something we have not had in a long time. Um, I'm really pleased to be able to um, to be working and moderating this panel with the staffers from uh, members of Congress that have really put election security as a priority, um, and something that we haven't had at EDN for a long time. Um, as people know, there hasn't been a lot of activity on the Hill addressing election security and the things that we're all here working together for, as Porvi mentioned, things that, um, while we may disagree, we all have the same common goals, and now we're seeing a lot more activity to move those common goals in Congress, which is fantastic. So before I introduce the panelists, I just want to bring us back a little bit to how we got here and um, the people that are that are moving the ball forward in Congress. And um, as everyone here knows, there's been a lot of concern about the security of elections, but we started to see it um, come into a sharper focus in the summer, spring and summer of 2016, when it was announced that there were breaches of voter registration databases in Arizona and Illinois. Um, and that probably sent a shiver down a lot of people's spines in this room. I know it did mine. And then there was an op-ed in the Washington Post by Bruce Schneier, where he connected the dots between those breaches to voter registration databases and what that could mean potentially for voting systems and election results, the actual machines that count our votes, and why we need auditable systems, why we need verifiable systems, and why there needs to be more involvement to ensure that all of our systems around the states have those protections and provisions. Then we went through the 2016 election. And in January of 2017, the ODNI came out with a report um, from the director, or the, I say director, uh, ODNI, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence released that report, that very um, uh, earth-shaking report that warned that Russian intelligence actors not only were uh, attacking voter registration databases, but they had obtained and maintained access to voting, uh, sorry, systems for electoral boards in state and local uh, jurisdictions, which, again, that was a very chilling reminder that this is a real threat. But thankfully, there are people in Congress that were paying attention. So in the last congressional session, the 115th congressional session, we saw le legislation being introduced that was going to actually address the problems that we've been looking at. Um, Senator Klobuchar and Senator, <clears throat> Senator Lankford, um, both of whom serve on the Senate Intelligence Committee that's held several hearings that looked at um, the security of election systems, uh, worked together to introduce the Secure Elections Act in the 115th Congress. Uh, so, um, Senator Klobuchar also serves as the ranking member of the Rules Committee in the Senate, which is the Committee of Jurisdiction for Elections uh, in the Senate. Um, and so we're really pleased to have Lindsey Kerr, who's general counsel from the Senate Rules Committee here. She works with Senator, Link, uh, sorry, Senator Klobuchar on the Secure Elections Act, on election uh, security policy. Um, and she can speak about what we can expect in the 116th Congress as we move forward from the Senate side, from Senator Klobuchar um, and the Rules Committee. Um, we're also really pleased to have Maura Bergen, who serves as the subcommittee director for the Homeland Security Subcommittee on Cybersecurity and Information Technology Infrastructure. Close uh, right? Close enough. Okay. Um, uh, which means that she works for uh, Chairman Thompson, who last session, as ranking member of the Homeland Security Committee, introduced the Election Security Act, a bill that incentivizes states for uh, adopting paper ballots and audits. Um, and in the 116th Congress, the provisions in the Election Security Act um, are represented in Title III of H.R. 1, the bill that recently passed the House to address um, a lot of election reforms. Um, so as we're moving forward into the 116th Congress, um, we're really pleased to see that there's a lot more activity on the Hill because, as many people know, there's been... Uh, really a um, deafening silence from federal legislators on election security um, 
going back to the Holt bill when there was the last time we really saw anything, uh, any prospects of anything moving forward. So we're really glad that there is uh, there is leadership now that's going to be moving uh, legislation, um, hopefully, uh, as we get closer and closer to 2020 and the elections beyond. So uh, um, we're going to turn it over to Lindsay and Maura to talk a little bit about what their boss's legislation looks like priorities, how it's going to be moving forward, and then we'll have some questions and um, learn more. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Lindsay. I am, uh, as Susan said, Senator Klobuchar's chief counsel on the Senate Rules Committee. I'm really happy to be here. This is my first EVN. I've been doing the sort of election uh, conference circuit. Uh, most of you probably know my colleague, my old colleague, Ben Hovland, who did a lot of this work for us on the committee before. Ben was recently confirmed to the EAC, which is, um, in our view, a huge win, uh, because now the EAC has quorum, and they're taking things up like VBSG. Very excited about that. Uh, I won't take up the full 15 minutes, uh, and I'm hoping that we can have sort of a, a collaborative discussion uh, about election security and what we need to be doing to improve and fortify our systems. But I will say that I, I want to start by saying thank you. So a lot of the people in this room have done some incredible work with us on the election security legislation that we have introduced uh, and that Senator Klobuchar has championed. I don't think it's a secret that Congress has a dearth of tech expertise. Uh, and so you all have lent your expertise and your insights to us, and that has made these bills much stronger. And I think possibly more than any other group that we have worked with, you all have pushed the ball forward on election security and made systems more secure. And I know Susan said Congress hasn't done a lot on election security, uh, but we have introduced bills, and I know that there's movement at the state level and that you all are working on that as well, and that's making a huge difference. So I, I first want to say uh, thank you very much to you all uh, for all the work that you've, you've helped us with. Um, we don't always necessarily agree on everything. I think we agree in principle, but I think we are all starting from the, the, the point that our, our elections are vulnerable, we're being targeted by, targeted by foreign adversaries, and we have to do something to, to strengthen our security when it comes to elections. And I think for Senator Klobuchar, I sort of think of her priorities in two buckets. One is making voting easier, and the second is making voting more secure. So making voting easier is things like automatic voter registration, same-day voting registration, um, doing things to improve the administration of elections so that we don't have long lines, those kinds of things. Election security is about fortifying machines, about paper ballots and audits. I think for us, those are the two sort of baseline things that we want to see in order to have stronger election security. Paper ballots, <coughs> excuse me, paper ballots and <clears throat> auditability. So we introduced uh, last Congress, as Susan said, the Secure Elections Act, Senator Langford. Uh, I would say I've spent the better part of two years of my life on that bill. Uh, and we were very excited that it was scheduled for a markup uh, last Congress. And then at the last minute, it got pulled. There were some, um, some political forces at play, and we were very disappointed that the bill got pulled. So right now, we're in the process of negotiating reintroduction with Senator Langford, working with Senator Langford and our partners. That bill had 14, a group of 14 bipartisan co-sponsors, so everyone from the chair and the ranking of the Intelligence Committee, Chairman Burr, ranking member uh, Warner, or chair, Vice Chair Warner, my boss, Senators Collins, Harris. Uh, so there's broad bipartisan support for the bill, and it, it did sort of three things. One, information sharing, something that we have heard from state and local election officials is that they feel like they're in the dark about the information that the federal government has regarding threats. And so we've worked to help get security clearances to those folks and to sort of help to open the dialogue between the federal government and states when it comes to information sharing about uh, election threats and making sure it's sort of a two-way street so that when states uh, become aware or vendors become aware of uh, a vulnerability that it gets shared and so that it can be remedied quickly. Uh, the second part is related to sort of 
idea of best practices, that we need to have some rules of the road in place so that states understand, here's the minimum that you should be doing when it comes to protecting your elections. You need to have strong audits, statistically significant audits, risk-limiting audits obviously being the gold standard of those, uh, and you need to have voter verified paper ballots in all of your all of your machines. And so that bill would have um, prevented any federal dollars from being spent on a machine that doesn't have a voter verified paper ballot. Uh, and, and so those are sort of the, the main um, pieces of the Secure Elections Act. Like I said, we're working uh, to introduce it. I think that for Senator Klobuchar, you know, we understand that we're going to have to make compromises when it comes to getting something that's going to get across the finish line. Um, in a dream world, every state would have risk limiting audits, um, and we'd be able to, to secure the funding for all of those states that have not good DREs uh, to replace them. Uh, we're working on that, and we hope we hope that that's that's sort of where we're going. Um, I think that's that's it for me. I'm going to um, uh, ask you to add one more thing to this, and I should have uh, added this in the, in the introduction. Um, initially, we had had a representative um, who has been working with Senator Lankford from the Intelligence Committee that was going to um, join the panel, and unfortunately, he was unable to make it. So um, I, uh, we, we were unable to get somebody else from Senator Langford's office, but Senator Langford's staff told me, we work so closely with Lindsay, and she's been so great in the bipartisan effort that we have um, on the Hill on this um, uh, Senate bill that um, Lindsay can characterize Senator Langford. So I'm just going to ask you to quickly um, put on your hat on and be pressed in the room. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I will say that I'll just speak for, for the work we've been doing with Jacob uh, and Sarah on Senator Langford's team. And I think it's an important, uh, important point to make, and I've been saying this at sort of conferences like NAS, um, where I talk about the work that we do with Senator Blunt, Chairman Blunt, who is uh, an excellent chairman, a former state election official himself, really sort of passionate about these issues and wants to see stronger election security. Uh, in my mind, working with the Lankford team and the Blunt team is a sort of a bright spot in what many could agree is a not so great time in our political system. So uh, the fact that we have been able to work on a bipartisan basis on this and sort of from that baseline that I talked about, which is that we're all on the same team when it comes to securing our elections. We just have to figure out how we can get consensus to do something about it. Um, Jacob and Sarah have been incredible partners in trying to uh, trying to ensure that the majority will help us move on, on this bill. Uh, they have been having significant conversations uh, within their caucus and having numerous meetings and trying to figure out what, what does legislation need to look like in order for us to get agreement to bring it to the floor. And so uh, I know that we have disagreements with the majority over things like funding, um, and we're, we're sort of working that out. So I'd say, you know, from, from their perspective, I know they very much want to see Secure Elections Act reintroduced. It's a huge, huge priority for Senator Lankford. He does sit on the Intelligence Committee, and we have found that folks who do sit on the Intelligence Committee, because they have sort of a, a, a deeper knowledge about the threats that we face, are uh, more willing to support, support this, this area. Uh, and support legislation. And so I think they very much want to get the bill reintroduced. And, and we're trying we're trying to learn from the lessons of last Congress and mm -hmm. sort of do something where we can we can drop something that we know can move move forward. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to then turn to Maura to talk about the security provisions in H.R. 1. Um, unless if you've been hiding under a rock, you might not know that H.R. 1 passed um, the House. Um, so that is the first piece of election security legislation, I think, that's passed uh, one chamber in a long time. And it has um, some great provisions on uh, auditable and secure elections, as well as some other um, provisions that I'm going to ask Maura to elaborate on, please. Sure. <clears throat> uh, my name is Maura Bergen. I work for the House Homeland Security Committee. Um, I will not take 15 minutes, mostly because I speak really quickly. But... Um, <laughs> So I, as Susan noted, I come from the House. Political landscape there is a little different than the Senate, uh, a little harder to get bipartisan agreement or, in fact, bipartisan interest on election security. So just to set the table for you all a little bit, um, House Democrats have been trying to get 
election security to be a House priority since 2016, um, when Secretary Johnson and the intel community started to make noise about um, uh, attempted interference in election systems um, in the summer of 2016, we were asking for hearings, we were asking for briefings, any real kind of oversight um, as to what the federal government was doing to secure our elections, um, and, and we just couldn't get it uh, on the majority's or the then majority's priority list. Um, last Congress, uh, we once again asked for hearings, asked for briefings, asked to do legislation, anything at all, really, to address this very serious national security issue. Um, and uh, once again, really couldn't get any traction until about halfway through 2018. Um, in terms of, of in terms of hearings, of course, we had funding. Um, enacted in the 2018 omnibus, but it was kind of um, too little, too late to make a big difference for the 2018 elections. Um, <clears throat> out of that frustration, Chairman Tom now Chairman Thompson formed the um, Election Security Task Force at the direction of Nancy Pelosi um, with uh, House Administration Committee Ranking Member Brady. Uh, they had a series of forums, briefings, et cetera. They, uh, on election security, they produced a report and uh, uh, legislation to implement recommendations that came from that report. Um, that was uh, H.R. 5011 last Congress. They had 126 Democratic co-sponsors. We couldn't get any Republicans. Go figure, but the price tag was $1.8 billion over 10 years, so that might have been a sticking point. Um, would point out that HAVA was $3.6 billion to fight some hanging chads, so I think $1.8 billion to, to fend off the Russians seems fair, um, <laughs> but that's me. Um, so I think moving forward, we are encouraged that on the House side, more Republicans are expressing interest in doing something on this issue. In fact, at our uh, election security hearing last month, the ranking member of our committee said you know, she's interested in doing work on bipartisan election security legislation. I think that's wonderful. And um, we look forward to working with anyone willing to work with us um, as we move forward. That said, there are certain there are certain elements we're not going to compromise on. We can't ask states to do uh, a bunch of improvements to their election systems and not give them money to do it. Um, we can't ask states to implement risk limiting audits, which is something we're probably not going to be willing to compromise on, um, and then not give them money to do it. Uh, security costs money, and things can't. These, it's not free. It would be great if it was free. It's not free. So we have to we have to provide resources and requirements. And together, I think that those two uh, those two criteria will secure our elections. Um, we also have to continue to retrain election officials. That's uh, election officials cycle out. So you have to continually retrain them. It's not a one and done. You have to. It's, it's an ongoing um, effort. It's not a. We can't treat it like a surge or a, a one-time thing. It ha we have to have plans for the future, and I think that's what the uh, Election Security Act does. Uh, it also provides funding for uh, research and development for more secure election systems. Um, always uh, positive to try and do better than we're already doing today. Um, and uh, hopefully we can make some progress on this moving forward. My boss has planned to reintroduce a standalone version of HR of, of HR 5011 this Congress. So uh, hopefully we'll get some Republicans to join us and we can get it across the finish line and then work with our Senate counterparts on something that will uh, make it, finally make it across the finish line. The president will sign. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. Sure. Um, so, I just want to go back a little bit to the um, to the uh, to the, the partisan issue, which unfortunately is the reality of today's um, political environment. We are in a highly, highly partisan world, um, and it's it's not isolated to Congress. Um, it's kind of or everywhere in the country. Um, uh, but I think that there is some agreement that we've seen from both sides of the aisle and from both sides of the political spectrum um, on the election security issue. Um, uh, I was uh, surprised to see even in the um, report that came from the House Oversight Committee in the last election before the leadership changed that there was a, a recommendation for paper records in a report that came out of the, that um, committee. So there is some overlap. So um, how how can we try and um, and and bridge the partisan divide? And I know that you you mentioned that you're going to um, look at taking the uh, election security provisions out, and that Ranking Member Rogers had also 
indicated some interest in it. Do you think that there is, um, there's, where, yeah. Where, where's the next next step? Sure. What's the next right step? So just, I want to be, I want to be clear about where I, what I, yeah. uh, okay. how I characterize Ranking Member Rogers' statements. Okay. I, specifically on our provisions, he did not make any comments. He said okay. he was interested in working on election security mm-hmm. in a bipartisan way. So I just want to make sure that I'm characterizing yeah. what he was saying correctly. Um, in terms of next steps, I think it's a lot about educate, education, and I think it's educating the states. I think there's a lot of, um, I think there's a lot of, of, flimsy messaging happening in terms of what our objectives are. There, there are people who continue to believe that we wish to federalize elections. We certainly don't. <laughs> we do not have that bandwidth. Um, we don't, <laughs> don't want to do it. Um, want to give some states some money to make elections more secure and help achieve baseline standards, but certainly do not want to be administrating them or, or federalizing them. And I think educating the state level folks, and then more importantly, the local folks. From, uh, we do oversight over DHS's activities as they relate to election security. Um, DHS is new to this, relatively new to this um, community, and they have done a good job reaching out to states. They have much more to do in terms of reaching out to the locals. But I think once the state and local election f- officials understand the services that the federal government can provide and that with more they can do more, um, both at the federal level, providing resources to election security, or election um, assistance commission and also DHS for these for its mission in election security, and that providing the state's resources to do better, um, there can be a sort of a groundswell of support for the federal government to act. But I think that takes a lot of education, and I think we're just not there yet. I think that's right. And I think, you know, on the DHS piece, there's people like Chris Krebs, former Microsoft guy, uh, and Matt Masterson who who get it and who have been doing some really incredible work to try to secure our elections. And I think now we've we've asked them for help with the state election official piece. And I, I said this at, at NAS as well, where these folks have an incredible uh, influence over Congress state election officials, particularly secretaries of state. Uh, and that has been a major sticking point for us in trying to get them on board with our efforts because, um, as Mara said, they are very concerned about their jurisdiction over elections and see any sort of federal intrusion as the big bad, you know, federal government's coming in and taking away what is our constitutional duty to administer elections. And every every piece of legislation we work on, we have, like, up front and center, we say, uh, we understand that states administer elections. We have inserted the word voluntary more times than mm-hmm. I can express. Um, it, it, even in places where it doesn't really make sense, it's like, let's put voluntary in front of it. Um, to make it very clear that these are sort of baseline voluntary guidelines for you to implement. Uh, and something that Secretary Padilla from California said at NAS was, you know, if you don't want election, acu- election security money or assistance, that's fine. Just don't take it. Don't prevent us who do want it from getting the resources and the expertise. And I think, you know, the education piece is, is a big part of it. And I know that some folks in this room are doing a lot of work when it comes to educating state officials about things like risk limiting audits and taking this sort of um, mystique out of what, what that means and uh, making it clear that it's not maybe as hard as some people think it is. Uh, and that is very helpful, uh, educating folks about audits, paper ballots. Um, I I think... My, my boss is working with Senator Udall and Senator Merkley on the Senate companion to HR1, which has excellent, very strong election security provisions in it. Senator McConnell has made it very clear publicly how he feels about HR1, um, and it's not good. Uh, he doesn't have a good feeling about it. Um, so the path forward when it comes to to that sort of remains to be seen. If there will be movement, if we can pull pieces out and get movement on it, in my mind, our best shot is continuing the work that we're doing on Secure Elections Act mm-hmm. with Senator Langford as the lead uh, and continuing to push forward in in that way. And in partnership with DHS, because, I mean, under the Trump administration, uh, you know, Secretary Nielsen, Chris Krabs, and Matt Masterson are doing 
some pretty great work uh, to try to build up election security. And, and we've been working closely with them. And I think one great thing that they've been doing, to your point about you know, getting states on board, is partnering with the Election Assistance Commission uh, in order to have them sort of be the liaison with states about these things. Because, uh, I mean, for better or worse, over the over the past decade, states have, have come to know the EAC, and there's there's some trust there. Uh, whereas, you know, when DHS, when when we make the critical infrastructure designation under the Obama administration, there was, I mean, Secretary Johnson, Jay Johnson, talks about like being on these calls with state election officials where they essentially were like, "We will we will sue the crap out of you if you make election infrastructure critical infrastructure," and they pushed so hard against it, and he did it anyway. And I think that people now sort of agree that that was the right thing to do, uh, and so I think continuing to sort of bridge that gap between DHS uh, and the states through, I think, EAC is, is an important step. We also, during, during Secure Elections Act, um, made sure to frame this as the national security issue that it is, because I think that helps to build bipartisan support. In partnership with folks like, like Larry at the Brennan Center and some others, we were able to get some, some really prominent national security officials from both you know, Republican and Democratic administrations to do things like send letters in support um, to to work with election officials on discussing how this is a national security issue. That helps. So continuing to do to do those kinds of things, I think, helps. Um, do you have anything? To add? Uh, no, I mean, I think I, I think I share your view that we need to continue to try and work in a bipartisan fashion. I'm aware of Ms., uh, Mr. McConnell's views in HR1. I wonder if they're still the same on the election security provisions and also recognizing the House sort of has staked out their position on what election security needs to look like, if that can help pull uh, the Senate along on some more strict provisions. I don't, I don't, I'm not an expert on the Senate though. So. <laughs> the do, of the House. Yeah. I mean, and I think that's a point, like I know that Senator Wyden spoke here earlier about his legislation, the Pave Act, which has probably, it's like the gold standard of the standards in terms of strength for election security. And, and I do think that, um, Legislation like that has a positive impact in terms of providing leverage so that when we do go to the negotiating table, we can say, listen, you know, we need audits. We, these are the strongest audits. Like how can we, how can we negotiate, negotiate on something strong, maybe not getting the absolute best or all that we want, uh, but what can we achieve? So there were two things that came out, that popped out for me in what you're saying. And one was the education um, uh, segment of this and how important that's going to be um, to to build the bipartisan support, um, education around the security threats, but also education around what these bills really do, uh, i.e. not federalizing <laughs> elections. Um, so, but I want to put a pin in that for a second and go back to the appropriations because last session, $380 million of um, federal money was appropriated um, under the HAVA authorization um, that was a, a, um, for to, to, to improve the security of elections. Um, if there's more money appropriated, um, is, is it possible to put a floor, to put a minimum of security uh, requirements attached to that money, and what could that floor look like? And, um, and, and I'm not talking about legislation, I'm just talking about appropriations. Who wants um, to jump in first? <laughs> I mean, I think like, so so that, the Election Security Act does mm -hmm. a lot of that already, yeah. right? So it out would authorize a billion dollars in the first year to get the old, outdated election mm -hmm. ma machines out of use and replace them with um, paper ballots. Mm -hmm. um, and then it provides 175 every two years, one dollar per active voter. Um, and then after that, whatever is uh, appropriated, but beyond the one dollar per active voter, mm -hmm. it's this kind of race to the top model in terms of how the EAC could administer the funds. Um, recognizing that any funding for anything is an uphill battle. Um, I do, th I, I think the way you um, appropriate funding is by setting, by attaching standards to it. And if you're going to take money, then you have to, you have to take some kind of action to do what we want you to do. The money is an incentive, not like a gift. Mm -hmm. um, so it's an incentive to do, to do risk limiting audits. So for our bill, um, if you take the, if you take the first round of money to replace your machines, you have to certify that you'll implement risk limiting audits within five years. And we give you $20 million, not 
per state, but across the board, to implement risk limiting audits over time. So mm -hmm. I think that's it's a carrot and a stick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we we agree with that and had a, a similar structure in, in some of the bills that we worked on. I think we found with the $380 million, I know that there were folks in this room who very much disagreed with appropriating that money um, with the worry that we would get one bite at the apple and if there wasn't a strong um, floor, then states would buy crappy things with it and do not great things with it. Um, our assessment, and EAC has audited the money and uh, – I know some states are holding on to it, but our assessment is that hasn't happened, that they are using it for good cybersecurity-related things and replacing equipment. Um, we fought so hard to get that money. Uh, and the reason we fought so hard for it was because we knew that the window for 2018 was closing. And, I mean, to your point, it, it was too late for, for 2018. Uh, and that's why we've been pushing now to, to act, because it's getting to be too late for 2020. Um, it is very difficult when you go into negotiations uh, with folks and the view is we don't think this money should exist at all uh, to say here's the strings that we have to have attached to the money. I know that, you know, Secretary Merrill at the NAS conference asked me, um, do you support, you know, block grants to states with no strings attached at all to the money? Um, and the answer is we support a carrot approach, right? Like, if you want to do risk limiting audits, if you want to replace your paperless machines, here's some money in order to do that. Uh, we understand that there, there is going to have to be some flexibility when it comes to working with Republicans on providing states with money because there's just a different viewpoint, right? They, they think that states should decide how the money is spent, and we, have, we think there should be you know, some, more, some more strings attached to it. Right now we're at a point where um, – the Republicans have said to us, let's see how uh, the $386 million goes before we provide any more funds. Uh, some Republicans have said that. Uh, and that got a lot of pushback from state election officials. I think both some Republican and Democrat <coughs> election officials who said that is not uh, helpful at all because as we approach 2020 and we know that there are states who need to replace some of these machines uh, and they don't have the money to do it, Holding, holding back and saying, you know, they just got 386, which is quite frankly a drop in the bucket, right? Like my boss says it's 3% of one aircraft carrier. And it is such a small amount of money when you talk to, when you talk about the overall money that we spend on defense. Uh, and this is, you know, the most fundamental part of our democracy and we should make significant investments in it. Uh, but that's what they've been, they've been saying. And, and I know that you know, in the report language for the appropriations for that $386 million, we sort of laid out a few things that the money needed to be used for. It wasn't binding its report language. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's an important thing, and I, I know that we'll keep pushing for it. Yeah, and just to piggyback on that, I think that the other approach is looking at um, how you write, how you uh, – vendors, how you, how you deal with vendors and setting certain standards for um, – who, who states can buy money from or buy resources from. Um, the Election Security Act sets out a series of requirements for qualified election vendors, and it runs the gamut from, um, you know, the, the whoever owns the company or whoever is the CEO has to be a, um, a legal resident of the United States or a U.S. citizen to supply chain issues. The company should disclose where the parts are coming from, so we are aware, at least, of, of what potential vulnerabilities could be um, in the systems. So I think that's another approach to setting some baseline standards that aren't necessarily targeted at the states, right? Because mm -hmm. it's not requiring the states to do anything. It's requiring the vendors to step up. That's, okay. a, that's a place you'll see. I, I think we're going to start doing a lot more work in that space. I know OSET is um, a sponsor of this conference, and I saw Eddie here somewhere. Hi, Eddie. Mm -hmm. Eddie's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we are going to start to do some more. I, I think there's an agreement, at least with folks uh, in, in our caucus, there needs to be more oversight over the, ven the vendors. Uh, and, yeah, that's, that's what, what I'll say. We're, we're going to try to work more in that space. And so um, that dovetails to my other uh, area of inquiry, which is regarding oversight from both of the committees. And so we'll start, um, because we're kind of talking about that, uh, with the EAC. And what areas of oversight 
do you think the EAC could be doing more? And, and I, I think that's an interesting question about vendor, um, uh, vend vetting the vendors, because um, I actually saw a really great presentation that was done um, by somebody from the EAC on vetting vendors, but it was given to a very small um, audience, and it, it's not sort of blown up. And there, I think there's opportunities for, like, the EAC to, prov to be providing more guidance for election officials to be vetting their vendors. Um, Homeland Security could be doing the same thing, providing um, guidance and, and recommendations. So I'm wondering, uh, what areas do you think the committees can enforce oversight um, on, with the EAC and then also um, DHS to improve the election security landscape or profile in our country without passing legislation? Where can we pressure them to be working, to be, where can they be doing more to improve the, the security? Um, so I, I'll, I'll start. And then, <laughs> cause, um, so I guess I, I would start by saying, I think what we need to understand first is what DHS and EAC are capable of doing, both in terms of the depth of their expertise and what their current staffing is um, and what their resources are. Uh, HR1 would require EAC and DHS to do resource assessments to determine what they actually need to be able to carry out their mission and then to ask for it. DHS got $33 million for um, election security in the last go-around, so I think um, that should be helpful. It was like $8 million more than they had last year. So hopefully that will help them um, do their work. But in terms of prioritizing what activities EAC does and what activities DHS is doing and how DHS and EAC can collaborate together, I don't know that anyone has really taken a step back and figured out like a strategy for what these two agencies should be doing and how they should be working together. I know that their relationship and their coordination has improved greatly over the past two years, but I haven't... It, it seems almost like a, I don't, I don't want to be so cavalier as to call it a whack-a-mole, but it does seem to be as like something comes up, it gets addressed, as opposed to a strategy. And that's something where I think, you know, our committees can come in and help guide what our expectations are of them, mm -hmm. and that, yes, we would like you to look more at um, standards for vendors. We want you to do more about how you test machines. But I think we have to understand if the expertise – what resources they have to actually be able to execute. Yeah, I think that's right. And I, you know, we're going to have a, a hearing next month uh, with an oversight, EAC oversight hearing um, that I think will be particularly helpful. We haven't had one of those in a while. Um, so that's a, a positive development that Senator Blunt is supportive of. Um, I, I think, you know, as the EAC, you know, they just did their, their notice for VVSG, uh, I think it's incredibly important for us to do significant oversight over that process in particular. Uh, were we being Senator Klobuchar uh, is going to submit a comment on VVSG uh, during the comment period. And I think, you know, things we've heard as we have sort of waded into this space is like, it takes 18 months to get your machine certified. That's nuts. Like, that's totally nuts. Um, and ways to improve the certification process, ways to improve um, the testing. We've heard some not great things about the labs uh, and how those can be improved. Uh, improving the technical capacity of uh, folks at the EAC is something that we are going to, to prioritize, how they are conducting oversight over, over vendors. One thing for my boss, and this is sort of related to your question, but a, a little bit off, is that you know, my boss is the ranking member on the Judiciary Subcommittee for Antitrust, and she has expressed some serious concern in the recent past about the fact that <clears throat> there are three top vendors, 90% of Americans vote on a machine manufactured by those those three. And there's, you know, and we've worked with OSED about this, you know, the market seems to be broken, right? Um, there's no innovation. The barriers to entry are very high. And so something that we want to do more oversight when we talk about the vendors and, and working with EAC is to address some of those issues. Uh, and, and I think now that we have a quorum at the EAC, um, doing more oversight is, is incredibly important. That's something that you'll see our, our committee doing more of. Okay, thanks. So all of that makes me want to ask like 12 more questions. But at this stage, I'm going to open it up to the audience um, for questions.
Hi, my name is Matt Caulfield. I'm from the Wharton School, and the vendor sort of point piqued my interest. We wrote a report two years ago um, with OSET's support on the topic. Um, I had a question about sort of thinking about the effects of certain regulations rather than just we want the so we for example vendor vetting, right? What would the downstream effects of that be for the private market for election tech? Because fundamentally, all election tech is distributed right, as of now through private markets, right? So say we vet vendors and two of the three vendors that currently sort of dominate the market don't meet the, meet the vetting requirements. So now we have one vendor and how does that affect pricing and supplying technology and actually incentivizing the offering of the technology that we might want to require states or uh, local administrative officials to purchase? I mean, I think it depends on how you regulate, what, what you consider vendor vetting to be, right? So part of it is transparency. I think um, a lot of the people we spoke with as we were preparing our report last year talked, when they talked about vendors, they were essentially, like it's, a, it's kind of a black box to them, who they are, where they come from, um, the mach their equipment, whatever, all of, kind of a black box. So... I think part of it is just transparency, right? And so, and if you if you go towards transparency on some level, that shouldn't be um, that shouldn't shut people out. Um, and the if you look at the vendor requirements in HR one, they're not they're not terrible. They are important and they help bring some transparency and some general guidance to what we expect the vendors who are selling equipment to our election officials to be doing. Um, but they're not. I don't. I wouldn't say that they're overly rigorous. And I wouldn't. If if someone's not meeting those kinds of criteria, um, they shouldn't be participating in the marketplace anyway. I mean, this is a, it, it's a national security issue. So on some level, um, yeah. If you're if you're not if you're not up to the if you're not meeting the bar, then maybe you shouldn't be participating and you can improve your, your business practices. But yeah, I, I think that's right. And I mean, to your point, obviously we are concerned about the marketplace shrinking, right? So there are top three. And if you, um, if you make the marketplace even smaller and concentrate even more, that's worse. Uh, so we don't want to do that. But I, I think that having some minimum vetting standards, I mean, things like, hey, what's your supply chain plan? Like, how do you manage that? What are the security provisions that you're taking into consideration there? Can't even get answers at, on those basic questions at this point, and that's a major problem. Yeah. Is there someone else have the microphone or Josh? I have a microphone. Oh. <laughs> Hi. Hi. I'm Joe. Oh, okay. With regards to interacting with um, possible um, folks on both sides of the aisle in crafting bills. I'm wondering what kind of horse trading comes from the GOP. Do they come to you with some text and say, I'd love to see this in the bill? And I'm wondering what that might reflect from their point of view. The answer might just be no, it doesn't happen, of course. Um, yeah, I mean, I think... Well, Senator Lankford has the Secure Elections Act, and, and that's his bill, and, and those, I think, reflect his priorities. I do think it's um, it's not a secret that with Secure Elections Act, we started here, uh, and it was less about what can we add in and more about, mm, we got to take some of this out. Uh, and that was really driven, and again, this is well publicized, driven by um, secretaries of state and and that group who wanted to see less instead of instead of more. That's sort of been my experience. There's a handful of folks on the Republican side who do have some really good ideas on ways to strengthen election security and come to the table. And that happens a lot with any legislation, right? You start with one you start with a a bill and then what you end up passing or what the end is doesn't sometimes look even remotely like what you started with. Um, yeah, without trying to get myself into trouble, that's what I'll say. <laughs> Josh? Uh, hi. You, I'm sorry, did you want to? Oh. No, I mean, there's not much to say in the House side. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I like a lot of what I've seen in, in this and, and uh, much of the other legislation, but I've also become concerned that much of the legislation I've seen, including in particular the uh, 
Secure Elections Act and the Election Security Act, uh, the Safe Elections Act, I'm sorry, um, are overly prescriptive in some ways. And they, although have some good solutions, actually preclude some alternatives that could achieve the same goals that everybody in this room wants to achieve in, in other ways that, that may be better, that may be more accessible and, and may have other advantages. And I'm wondering how much openness is there to exploring other options and looking at other possibilities um, that might uh, target the goals rather than the prescriptive manner in which you're, you're trying to achieve the, the goals that, that we have. Do you have a like a, a provision in mind or an area? Uh, um, for instance, um, handmarked paper is often a concern for accessibility, for ambiguity, for, for um, many other problems. Um, voter verified paper trails can be replaced by alternatives that actually achieve uh, as strong verifiability uh, capabilities as, as others. And um, when, when we look so narrowly at the methods rather than, than our goals, I think we, we uh, lose a lot of our options for innovation. There, I should have, um, sorry, I, I should have employed the Trey Grayson rule of you have to say three things who you are, where you're from, and your question has to be a question. Um, and I did not do that, so my bad. But Josh, you didn't really, didn't really ask the question. Um, I, I, there. Well, I'm, I'm, well, the, the question is, yeah, how much room is there for altering this, expanding the, the, the legislation to accommodate other options? I, I mean, I'm surprised to hear a question like that here, um, because most <laughs> oh, from my I didn't know who you're with. <laughs> um, you know, I think, like I said, we we have started with the premise that uh, ballots that are hand marked with optical scanners is like the most secure thing that we can we can have, right? Uh, I, uh, actually, I, I think there's. There is reason to consider other possibilities that might be more secure. Right. And so as we we sort of start with that, uh, we do hear from folks. Uh, and there is there's like this huge push and pull. Right. And this is what I when I said, like, I spent two years of my life doing this. It is, you know, on the one hand, you have cyber experts who do argue. And you saw this in Georgia. Right. They're moving to paper ballots. And you had um, cybersecurity experts who said, well, it's actually cheaper uh, and more secure to just have people mark with a pen and, and have an optical scanner um, that you can audit. That's the most secure thing. So, uh, and then you have folks who might be of more, more your persuasion who argue that there, there should be more flexibility. Uh, it's just a huge push pull, and you saw that with secure elections. I mean, we went back and forth over and over again um, over, over the language. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think states want flexibility in the voting machines that they can buy. I think from our perspective, um, what is most cost effective and secure makes the most sense. Yes, I agree. I agree. I don't, I don't, I, I think there were 126 Democrats that signed on to our bill last Congress. I don't see them changing their minds on something that uh, central to the bill. But we did negotiate. I mean, I will say, and folks, hit us for that, quite frankly. Um, we did understand that we had to compromise on certain provisions, and we did that. Uh, and so our goal is to get something done that makes voting more secure and stronger than where we were with nothing. Um, so, yeah. Thank you for spending your time with us today. This has been really helpful, and I, I appreciate your being here. I'm sure a lot of other folks do, too. Um, I'd like to ask... If you can give us some um, feedback on a question about um, the difference between, and, and it's, it's clarity of language, the difference between a paper trail and a paper ballot. Those, are sometimes, those words are sometimes substituted for each other, and they mean completely different things. Do you think Senator, Lang, uh, Senator Langford or Senator Klobuchar 
understand that those are two completely separate things and that the, and and if and if they don't then how can we help them understand that and oh by the way a hand scribbled ballot the research that's been done on that is that that is the most erroneous way to vote as far as you can tell uh I do think Senator Klobuchar knows the difference between a paper trail and a paper ballot. Well, well but no, the, no, the point is, no, I, I'm not trying to be glib. The, the point is, a paper trail comes when you get, it, it, it is more applicable to very large cities and counties sure. where they use electronic assistance in order to be able to have an electronic right. inventory and assistance to the voter. Um, a paper ballot isn't really useful to very large cities. It, it won't work in those cities. So that's why I'm asking you, but I, I was quiet while y'all talked. But what I'm trying to ask you is, do you understand that there's a big distinction between the two um, and that trying to just ignore big cities' needs for something other than a manual slip of pa a manual piece of paper uh, is a very real and legitimate concern. And so I'm asking if these two bills understand that if you are really trying to to take this down to only a, you know, um, a hand, you know, marked manual piece of paper that you're going to be hurting and, and, uh, and not supporting big cities. Yeah, no, I... I I, I think in the Secure Elections Act, um, the the way that the language reads is that you can't buy a machine that doesn't have a paper record. So, like a ballot marking device, you would be able to purchase something like that, just so long as what was printed had, you know, a voter could verify it. It wasn't simply a barcode. Yeah, um, but I, I will say on the audit piece. Um, the audit couldn't be done with a machine. It needed to be a, a manual. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Folks, I'm just going to interrupt um, and claim uh, older person's privilege here. Um, it is critical that we disagree without being disagreeable and that we be respectful. We do not interrupt. And this sort of shushing and booing that's sort of subterraneous right now needs to stop immediately. Immediately. Sorry, I just needed to. Um, I have an eight-year-old. I'm used to speaking like that. <laughs> Next question. Did someone else have a question? We uh, yes. Karen McKim from Wisconsin, uh, Citizens Group Wisconsin Election Integrity. My question has to do with, you, you're saying good things that are music to my ears about this legislation addressing the vendors, but all the examples you used were about manufacturers. And earlier today, I was having a conversation with Matthew from the Warren School, and we were talking about that small army of very small family-owned companies that uh, service our voting machines. And um, basically, uh, they have enormous access to our voting equipment. And in the 2016 Wisconsin recount, one of the most astonishing problems we found was that in one county, the voting machines had been left unsealed by the service technician over the course of several elections and no one had noticed. So uh, my question is, when you are working on this legislation and talking about making sure the vendors are um, better at security practices. Are you going to be touching on all these small voting machine service companies that also have enormous access? Thank you. So, and I can just speak to that really quickly and then I'll turn it over to you. Um, in HR1, any time you use federal grant dollars to, pro to procure any kind of election service, any election good, you have to, it has to meet the qualifications of the qualified election vendor. So it would, if you're using federal money for that, the election vendors would have to meet that criteria. And in, in our legislation, <laughs> vendor, we're using sort of to mean both the manufacturer and the servicer. Yeah. Um, did Warren, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, just a little bit more on, on, on Dana's point. I'm Warren Stewart, Verified Voting. Uh, Warren Stewart at Verified Voting. And I had somewhat the same question about uh, what do you mean by paper ballot? 
And the, the, the fundamental difference is whether the vote is recorded directly into computer memory, the recording of the vote, what the voter does when they um, alter the medium that's going to preserve their intent. Um, it's not whether it's counted by a, a computer or not. So when, when people use the term voter mark paper ballot, that could be with the use of an assistive device, a ballot marking device, but it does not allow for the, the a DRE okay. in which the vote is the vote that counts, the vote that gets counted, at least initially, is a digital vote that no one can observe like you can observe on a paper ballot. Right. And that um, VVPAT, that, even though there is this paper record, which is different than a paper ballot, um, that's an adjunct. The, the, the ballot, the vote, has been cast directly electronically. So do, does this, does this uh, legislation allow for the continued use of DREs that have a VVPAT? Or is this a bill that requires voter mark, whether by hand or with the use of an assistive device, that is then, uh, then that's the only ballot. So more than half the country now uses a system in which votes are not recorded into directly into computer memory. And is this a bill that will bring that up to 100% if everybody buys in? Or are we still going to have DREs with VVPAT count as a paper record. I think that's the, that's the critical distinction, is it's, it's the recording of the vote, where it gets turned into the consent of the governed being transferred to those who govern. It's at, at that point of recording, rather than counting, uh, is the distinction. And when, when the word paper ballot gets used interchangeably with paper record or with a paper trail, Paper trail, paper record, the paper ballot provides that, but it's not a paper ballot. It's, an, it's still an electronic ballot on a DRE. Mm -hmm. There's a, no, I'll wrap it up, sorry. Is this a completely new distinction? Yeah. Good. Yeah. I, what do you mean in this legislation when you say paper ballot? So HR1 has ballot marking device or the optical scan. Yeah. That so... No DREs for right. No, the goal the goal is the, for states to replace the DRE. That's why we have a billion dollars in the first round of grants in HR one. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> Hi, Lula Farstad. I'm a freelance journalist. So I'm really pleased with a lot of the things that you said, but a lot of it I think is that, you know, the devil is in the details. And I understand your approach in terms of carrots and using that word voluntary and things like that. But I also understand how then things get subverted sometimes on the other end. So I'm uh, leading an audits working group in New York, and we've been reading uh, risk limiting audits legislation from around the country. And one of the things we keep being surprised to find is that, for example, the risk limiting audits take place after certification which I think is the case in Virginia, or the races aren't chosen randomly, or um, the audits are voluntary, or uh, one of the main things I think when you look at the principles of audits is that they be conducted by a neutral party. When you look at those original principles that are on electionaudits.org uh, and some of the, even the updated uh, principles that came out in 2018. And it's very rare to see states legislation where those audits are being conducted neutrally by, you know, by, a comptroller's office or, an, you know, a neutral party. So I'm wondering, I, given within the, the constraints that you have to keep, you know, using voluntary and, you know, the carrot approach, how can we get to a situation where we're going to do all this work, years and years and years of pushing these things forward? How can we be sure that at the end of the day, they're going to be meaningful, right? That's, that's my concern. I think it's a great a great point, and I know that when we were working with folks um, on crafting secure elections, it was made very clear to us that if you have audit provisions, but you don't have a line that says that must be conducted before the election is certified, then it's it's not as meaningful as it needs to be. So we were careful to include that language. Um, 
I don't, to be honest, I don't think we have language in the bill about who specifically, like a, a, a neutral party conducting um, the audit. And I think that's absolutely something that is, I mean, what we saw in Georgia um, is, is an excellent point. Yeah, I would just say in HR1, they're not, they're mandatory. If you take any federal money, you have to um, implement risk limiting audits. Um, if you do an HR1, you have to do it. If you take any federal money, you have to implement risk limiting audits within five years. Right, but my question is just a risk limiting audit could be conducted in so many different ways. It could be conducted by the same people who are sure. counting the elections for the first time. So I'm just asking, is the legislation trying to put these, and these are not my principles, they're like best principles that are written up, but right. are you referring to them when you're writing the legislation? So our, I think our risk limiting audit language is actually quite strong in, in HR1. Um, it is intended to occur, and occur before certification and they're mandatory, so. I would, I'll just make a plug to read the risk limiting audit language in um, HR1 because it's, I think you'll be very happy with it. Um, we, I think we have time for one more quick question. I'm sorry, yes, please. Chris Walker, uh, County Clerk in Jackson County, Oregon. Very fortunate to be in Oregon, center wide and being here. Like Dana, I'm a, on the feet on the ground local elections official administering elections. And mine is more so some comments. So I completely agree with all of you about the educational piece. Uh, the gentleman earlier, when our previous speaker was here, was talking about uh, spam, the risk of spam, phishing attacks, things like that. As an election goes on, it's being monitored by our IT staffs. We can see where the increase in those infiltrations of the attempt to infiltrate increase as the election moves forward. That is always a huge concern of mine because as you're busy getting emails from around the country talking about, I didn't get a ballot, I'm in the military, I need this, I'm a UACAVA voter, your mind is so busy on trying to put on an election that you may put yourself in a vulnerability by thinking, okay, I'll click on this. Well, guess what? You're not at that point thinking, oh, is this a spam attack? Or I'm going to delete this email because it doesn't look quite right. Then the next thing I know, I've got a letter to the editor stating that I never responded to a legitimate request for somebody who desperately wanted to be able to exercise their right to vote. So education is huge. I know we work very closely with our Secretary of State's office to try to conduct ongoing and regular trainings. But once a year, twice a year, when you have a constantly rollover of staff, I have a 2.5 staff um, in ours, full-time staff, um, is really hard when you're bringing a lot of temporary help to, to conduct elections. Um, also, the piece of funding, and I know you hear that all the time, but it truly is a huge piece of what we do. My particular county board, Dana has a different board. Even within our states, we have different funding mechanisms. We are expected to be self-supporting, meaning my department, based on the revenue in our recording office, which is under the county clerk's realm, we pay for all of our elections on recording revenue and all of our employee costs. We do get $11,000 stipend from our board to cover the uh, increasing cost of the PERS obligation. But that is the only thing where we get from the general fund. In fact, we don't even use that because we always create revenue, even paying 100% for our election costs. So to ask for additional requirements um, at the federal level, and I'm all for that, I'm really glad they're trying to take a genuine interest and champion us in this. I think that that funding is a huge piece. Now in my county, we have already purchased new equipment and not, I believe, from one of the three largest vendors. Um, uh, or excuse me, business partners is the way I term them. Uh, I come from a small business culture. Uh, my father, 55 year owner of a business. So I truly believe we are partners in what we do. And that separation is, is not a good thing. Um, and. I think we can collaborate, we mutually benefit each other. So just a couple comments. I really appreciate you taking an interest in what we do and a little different perspective. I, I really appreciate that perspective. And I, I, you guys are, as local election officials, literally on the front lines of this, right? And so what you described in my mind is nuts. 
right, that you don't have the resources that you need. And something that we've heard, it's been interesting for me in, in, in education to talk to the secretaries and then talk to the locals um, and the different perspectives, right? And so one of the things that we are going to try to push for is some sustained funding, not just, I mean, these big chunks to help replace the DREs are, is very important. But I think a steady stream of federal funds that says, you know, it doesn't have to be a huge amount of money, but a couple of million dollars every year so that states can do things like, hey, I need, I need an IT person um, who's going to be like our state person on election security, or I know that I'm going to need to buy X, Y, and Z. Just some kind of reliability is very important. So that's something that we're going to push for. And I know that one of the things we're trying to explore is a way to say X percentage of those funds must go down to the state and locals or the locals uh, and county officials, because uh, I know it doesn't always flow, flow down. Um, yeah. And I just piggyback on that. Um, also, thank you. I worked at a, um, the Monroe County Board of Elections when I was in college. So I, I very much understand, and they were gearing up for the 2000 election. Um, so I understand the nights, weekends, you all work to make sure elections run smoothly. So thank you very much. Um, also appreciate the resource constraints that happen at the local level, particularly, I mean, talk about having a, a cybersecurity person at the state level. What about the local levels? I mean, you... I imagine in most counties it's one person servicing not just the elections board, but also the clerk's office, the, you know, whatever, whatever functions of government are pushed down to the county level in that state. They're doing it for everyone. Um, they're not dedicated. They're not dedicated. And to your point, there's turnover and then there's temporary staff. So I think the, Lindsay's point, the sustained funding is important. Um, H01 does it with 175 every two years. Also, um, very good point about making sure that the money gets pushed down to the locals, because that's really where the rubber hits the road on this stuff. Um, the HR1 has a provision requiring um, regional, uh, at, at the state election board, when you're deciding how the money is going to be spent, it's sent down from the federal government. There's representation from rural, urban, um, local areas. So making sure everyone has some kind of input in where the money is going. So, okay. So um, with that, I think that's a great note to end on. Um, I want to really thank um, Lindsay and Maura for coming to uh, EVN and sharing their time with us. Um, it's the week before recess, so that can often be like a really crazy time. Um, and they've been very generous to come and speak with us and also to thank Ranking Member Klobuchar and Chairman Thompson for their leadership um, in Congress on this important issue. So I hope you welcome, thank me, uh, well, join me in welcome and thanking them. Okay, we're going to take a five-minute break.